I'm glad that this hour has arrived and I want to welcome everyone to the opportunities and tools to investigate occupational factors for COPD. And this is sponsored by the Respiratory Health Cross-Sector Council of the National Occupational Research Agenda. My name is Paul Henneberger and I um, am the Senior Science Advisor in the Respiratory Health Division at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I'm also the co-chair of the NORA Respiratory Health Cross-Sector Council and a member of the webinar organizing committee. I wanna thank the other members of the committee. Uh, there's three other members, uh, Thomas Croxton at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, uh, Rafael De La Hose at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, and Lisa Posto who is uh, with the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. So let's move directly on to uh, the keynote presentation. Uh, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Paul Blanc presenting on the topic of what is work-related COPD. Uh, he's a professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine is well known in um, uh, COPD research and occupational COPD research. So Paul, thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Paul. And I want to confirm that everyone can see the slides. Yes. yes, good. Yes. I have nothing to disclose. So my goals this morning in this introductory talk are to define uh, COPD and chronic bronchitis, both epidemiologically and clinically, but to contextualize this in terms of work relatedness, uh, to share with you summarized data from a range of studies emphasizing uh, pooled analyses that have been emerging and then address the policy and clinical implications of these data. I want to start, though, with a case presentation, which also helps to focus uh, thoughts. Uh, this was a patient who, at the time I saw him first, was 68 years old with progressive dyspnea over five years uh, with shortness of breath on exertion only, uh, for example, with going up a flight of stairs carrying groceries up a hill. He had no dyspnea at rest and he had no paroxysmal symptoms. He only had very occasional wheezing with chest colds. He had no chronic cough. He had been a cigarette smoker uh, a number of years previously uh, uh, and a total pack years that even generously estimated was not more than 25. But he did have extremely dusty work uh, with uh, characterization of concrete dust from grinding large concrete display tanks as a uh, preparator of exhibitors, exhibit ex exhibitions in an aquarium. Uh, he also worked with epoxies and fiberglass. He did about six to eight tanks per year over seven years. So that was really an extensive operation and then had less exposure in the years preceding his retirement. He was thin but not cachectic. He had a prolonged expiratory phase without wheezes or ronchi. He had no loud S2 and he had no clubbing. He did, however, have uh, marked obstruction without any reversibility and a reduced diffusing capacity, even when adjusted for his observed ventilatory volume. Uh, 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 two week trial of prednisone did absolutely nothing to his airflow. And his CT scan, as you can see, shows uh, areas uh, uh, consistent with uh, emphysema. Uh, in fact, he'd been part of a respirator uh, fit program and pulmonary function spirometry surveillance uh, prior to this time. And so I had the benefit of nine serial measurements over 11 years, then a gap of six years until I saw him and I followed him up over the next nine years. And these follow-ups included measurements of diffusing capacity for the first time serially. And here you see his FEV1 is F, uh, forced expiratory flow rate at 25 to 75. And uh, what you can see is in fact, in a breakpoint analysis, there was a, a decline in the years when he was working and exposed and then uh, some stability in the FEV1, FEC, but then further decline in his uh, FEF 25 to 75. And his diffusing capacity uh, 
was um, more or less stable, except with one abrupt decline uh, with, a, with an exacerbation of illness. Other data of importance is that uh, a serum anti-1 antitrypsin analysis uh, showed that he was ZZ phenotype uh, and in absolute terms had a low value. So now I have a question for the audience, which you won't be able to answer because we don't have uh, that capability, but uh, you'll, you'll understand where I'm going with this. Did this guy have smoking related COPD? Did he have anti-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Did he have occupationally related COPD? Did he have emphysema or did he have all of the above? And my point is he had all of the above. He clearly had alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, but in fact, the uh, heavy dust exposure with the coincident decline during that time uh, uh, is consistent with occupationally related COPD. He did have some uh, smoking history that probably contributed as well. So to segue from that, just to definitions, COPD, even though we think of it as bread and butter, is really a modern construct and it subsumes three main disease labels, COPD, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis. You'll be hearing later in this webinar about emphysema and of course a great deal about classic COPD. Probably not too much on chronic bronchitis, although I'm gonna circle back to that. And each of these labels is based on uh, different criteria, which of course makes epidemiologists crazy. Um, the COPD diagnosis is based on lung function, but even there, there are varying uh, and differing uh, definitions uh, depending on what approach you're using. Most of you will be familiar with the gold approach, uh, uh, but there's certainly a movement now to use uh, less than the 90th percentile of lower uh, limit as the cutoff, not the fixed 70th. Uh, 70 percent of predicted. Some older studies are even more restrictive than uh, 70 percent. Um, what is the role of cigarette smoking? Well, of course, it is the leading established factor for COPD and counts for about 80 percent of all cases of disease. By 80 percent, that's another way of saying that the population attributable risk, also known as the population attributable fraction for smoking, is 80 percent. That, another way of saying it is that 80% of COPD uh, is preventable if uh, absolutely no one ever smoked ever again. Um, and I'm gonna return to the concept of the population attributable fraction. So of course, the primary focus of prevention efforts has been smoking, uh, but it's important to understand that the pulmon, the, uh, attributable fraction, the population attributable fraction can add up to more than 100% because different factors can add on to each other or can even multiply each other. Uh, although reducing any one factor should have the effect in, in that kind of uh, super additive model. Uh, but functionally, what the impact of the dominant role of cigarette smoking has been is a reluctance clinically to diagnose COPD in a non-smoker, something that we'll come back to in other speakers, and also a reluctance to diagnose asthma in someone who smokes rather labeling it COPD. And this, again, uh, causes a, a lot of uh, misattribution of disease, let alone trying to get at uh, the uh, contributing factors from an epidemiologic perspective. So if cigarette smoking doesn't cause 100% of disease, what else causes it? And what is the role of workplace exposures, which of course is the focus of today's uh, webinar? Is there a strong and plausible effect? And is it consistent across multiple studies? Uh, an, another way of saying is, is this a, a uh, likely to be a causal uh, association? So I'm gonna start off with an earlier American Thoracic Society statement on the occupational contribution to the burden of airway disease in which that uh, publication drafted in 2002, but only using studies through 1999, reviewed the links to asthma and COPD, emphasizing the estimated population attributable fraction and defined 
the work hazard broadly, uh, uh, typically in, in the analysis as exposure to vapors, gas, dust, and fume, or regular exposure to that on the job. There were eight epidemiologic studies uh, with a rather large pool of su subjects uh, where we could look at chronic bronchitis as classically defined by uh, productive cough for three months in a row for two years in a row. And in those studies, uh, the range was uh, two to 24% with a median value of 15% of, of bron chronic bronchitis being attributable to occupational histories of exposure to vapors, gas, dust, and fume. You'll note that uh, most of the studies, except for one from China, were from Europe or North America. There were also six epidemiologic studies with more than 12,000 uh, persons where there was actual lung function uh, data. And in those, the median value for the population tribal fraction was even higher at 18%. So the ATS document at that time came to the conclusion that a value of 15% is a reasonable estimate for the occupational contribution to the population burden of COPD. I can tell you that having been on that um, statement, that was extremely controversial. People did not have a problem with a similar estimate for asthma. But when we said this for COPD, uh, uh, heads were shaking. So in, at UCSF, we undertook really the first study that was done specifically to look at the association between occupation and COPD. All the others, the occupational question was asked really as uh, a covariate to take care of confounding, not because it was the uh, subject of interest. So we recruited uh, subjects. We did it through a national random digit dial sampling. And we oversampled in areas shown by NIOSH to have uh, higher than expected rates of COPD mortality. And this just shows you our sampling where we oversampled in the hot spots. We could do that because we weren't uh, interested in an, an estimate of the um, prevalence of COPD, but rather the risk factors associated with it. So we had uh, uh, 2,000 uh, persons and we oversampled for people with COPD. And this just shows you we define uh, occupational exposure not simply by uh, self-reported exposure to vapors, gas, dust, and fume, but also using a job exposure matrix as an alternative. What you can see here is that the odds ratio was two for self-reported vapors, dust, gas, dust, and vapors, dust, gas, and fumes, but also uh, was present for intermediate and high exposure based on uh, uh, job exposure matrix. And this shows you, in fact, uh, let me go back one to the, if I can. I just want to also emphasize here what the estimated population attributable fraction was. And you can see that um, we were coming up with numbers that were very similar to uh, those for uh, in the in the previous ana pooled analyses, but also when you narrow the definition just to COPD or emphysema and excluded anybody who solely had chronic bronchitis, uh, the um, population tubal fraction goes even higher. Now, please note that the population tubal fraction for smoking, either former or current combined was not 100%, and it was even a slightly less than 80%. And in fact, when we had this reviewed, we were criticized because uh, the smoking attributable fraction was not 100%, which underscores, I think, what people understood at that time. <clears throat> this analysis also showed you that the relative, that the odds ratio increased if you had combined uh, smoking and occupational exposure, uh, but it was uh, consistent with the cross product of the two risks, which, uh, although it's somewhat counterintuitive, is consistent with an additive, not a multiplicative effect because of the statistical nature of the odds ratio. Just I'll briefly and not use a lot of time, uh, summarize a couple of other studies we were involved in 
uh, not using random digit dial and with the benefit of lung function and uh, uh, bringing patients in. And in that study, based on a large HMO uh, with two, uh, 2,000 interviews, but 1, 1,200 clinic visits, including uh, 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 another uh, 300 age-matched controls without COPD, uh, we found uh, that high exposure to vapor gas dust and fume, not self-reported, but by job exposure matrix, was associated with a population interval fraction of 13%, and intermediate exposure was a much lower 2%. And if you add those two together, voila, it's 15%. Again, we're right in the ballpark. And even if you discount the intermediate exposure because it was not statistically significant, you're still left with 13%. And looking again at the model of <clears throat> cross product, you'll see again that it's uh, very close to the cross product of odds ratio. So much higher odds if you both smoke and have occupational exposure, um, but uh, it's consistent with an additive rather than a multiplicative effect. Um, we, uh, I also carried out uh, uh, another uh, analysis, uh, but I'm not gonna go over all of those here and they're in the reference list that you'll, you'll have. Um, so um, I want to show you this study, however, which again uh, showed, uh, uh, if, in fact, in this one, something less than a, a multiplicative effect. And this, in this study, we defined uh, smoking as uh, greater than 10 pack years because there were so few people that didn't smoke. And this was the study that I collaborated with you, uh, Dr. Fishwick, on. Um, Actually, here I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. This this is the study with Dr. Fishwick, and uh, in a quite heavily exposed uh, occupational exposure in Sheffield in England, you can see a quite phenomenal 32 uh, odds ratio if you were both uh, uh, a uh, cigarette smoker, a high level cigarette smoker, and uh, had occupational exposure, which tended to be quite high there. But again, all consistent with um, an additive effect, despite the remarkable risk. And here is um, a, an analysis of data from the Spiromic study, which uh, suggests that um, using a job exposure matrix, that in fact there was uh, an increased odds that were evident, uh, mostly among men, which is also consistent because when men are exposed on the job, their exposure tends to be higher. And so the signal can get diluted when you uh, do sex stratified analyses. What has changed also in the interval has been a series of studies where the data are more specific to emphysema, um, largely based on CT data. Although this very first study from 1996 um, showed an association specifically with emphysema using uh, hospital registry data. In Australia, there was a study also without CT, but with using the, I think, reasonable di uh, uh, diagnostic criteria of a reduced DLCO and emphysema uh, and report of COPD. And there they saw an increased association with biological dust, but not with uh, mineral dust or statistically with uh, gases and fumes. In the more current literature, we have the benefit of, of several large studies uh, that have had CT definitions of emphysema. So this is not COPD per se, this is specifically emphysema. And here you can see. Uh, in the lower panel, in the emphysema, an association with dust and fume, uh, statistically so, both for men and for women, 
the gas trapping analysis would be more relevant to COPD, where of course they also found an effect. Here is uh, data from the COPD gene study. And this also used gas trapping and uh, uh, CT evidence of emphysema. So I wanna focus here on the emphysema, which was associated uh, both with self-reported gas dust and fume and a little bit less so uh, with uh, job exposure matrix defined. So in my experience, usually when you have both, the truth is somewhere in between because the job exposure matrix uh, is a, a bit of a crude uh, tool and self-report may be prone to some over-reporting as, as of course is the standard critique. Here is an even more recent study from Sweden, which once again uh, found uh, for emphysema uh, an association. There was also uh, association with other uh, definitions of disease that are, are more relevant to COPD, but the point here is to emphasize that as we start looking for, we do see emphysema uh, itself related. Now there have, and here are some uh, further data from the spiromics cohort, uh, which uh, uh, is lo looking at the same question and sees uh, an association, uh, but uh, it's of uh, borderline statistical significance. There's also been, in addition to these data on emphysema, uh, Emerging data from a series of meta-analyses, I think that uh, Paul Hennenberger and his comments is gonna be returning to this topic. But I, just to summarize briefly some of these, here's one of the meta-analyses which shows the COPD PAR is 15%. That's a value that should be familiar to you all by now. And of course it does include some of the uh, studies that uh, were previously mentioned. Here is uh, a separate meta-analysis uh, uh, using 11 studies. <clears throat> this didn't look at the um, population of tubal risk, but it gives you a sense by looking at the odds ratio, uh, both in, from case control studies and uh, from uh, cross-sectional studies, both of which are statistically significant. And here's uh, yet another uh, meta-analysis, but with a very limited number of studies, but limited uh, narrowly looking at lung function and looking at mineral dust, gases, and fumes, and biological dust. All of them have increased odds ratios, although for gases and fumes, it's not statistically significant. So I started off with an ATS document. I wanna bring as we near the end, a second uh, joint ATS European Respiratory Society document, which look at a variety of non-malignant respiratory diseases. Here, I'm gonna focus on COPD and bronchitis. You can see the, how the uh, menu of studies has lengthened that one can look at. Uh, Dr. Fishwick was very involved in this segment of the analysis. And what you can see is that when you take all of these together, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity, but the pool population tubule fraction is 14%, uh, very close to what we've been talking about all along. We also had uh, a smaller set of studies relevant to chronic bronchitis. These previous studies were mostly based on uh, lung function definitions. And here you can see that the pooled population tubal fraction for those studies for chronic bronchitis is 13%. All of these take into account uh, smoking adjustment. Uh, and uh, here is a study which actually is, is, has not yet appeared. Uh, it is uh, in press looking at um, I'm sorry, this one has been published. This is from the Global Burden of Disease and appeared 
uh, about a year ago. And it shows you that, uh, I, I wanted to show you this because it juxtaposes air pollution with occupational exposures. And you can see that the uh, number of uh, uh, dailies, that is to say uh, disability uh, years, uh, of course is less than that from cigarette smoking, but in fact uh, uh, is uh, not at all trivial and is in the range of the estimates with uh, air pollution and at some points been uh, higher. And uh, here is a study and analysis of bold, which is the one that's in press now and looks at a, a, a selected subset of uh, occupations, some with organic fumes, some with inorganic fumes, and uh, some with uh, what we would call gases and fumes. And you can see elevated point estimates of risk for almost every one of these um, uh, types of occupations. We also have a lot of data now, and this may even not be complete, but this is uh, what I have managed to glean from the literature among never smokers. Uh, some published studies do uh, dichotomize in that way, so you can look at the data, and there's even a couple of studies that are limited to non smokers. And for them, the population approval fraction, in fact, is double the 15% we've seen. Uh, it's, uh, it's 31%. Um, and uh, if you look at the median value, it's 34%. And that, of course, makes sense because if you take out one of the major risk factors, uh, something else has to increase. There have been a number of industry-specific analyses that have shown uh, that exposure is related to COPD, but also to bronchitis or emphysema in uh, both coal mining and gold mining, in fact. So we have biological uh, uh, reasonable uh, data in that regard. And here's just an analysis showing the decline uh, uh, in occupation compared to smoking for a series of industry-specific studies where uh, such data were available. And what you can see is that the, uh, the annual excess loss in FEV1 uh, from the occupational exposure is uh, about 50% on average of what it is for smoking. And that, again, is a completely reasonable finding. So just to summarize these data, uh, I would say that multiple studies worldwide using various methods have consistently shown an association between occupation and COPD and also specifically chronic bronchitis. For all of these, the median value of the population tubal fraction estimates is around 14% in non-smokers, it's higher. And now emerging data with emphysema uh, using C CT data also show an association between uh, exposure and emphysema. The clinical implications, in my opinion, are that an occupational history should be obtained in all COPD patients, that the question, the single screening question of exposure to vapors, gas, dust, or fume uh, is a reasonable one on your longest held job in particular, uh, to recognize that in smokers, occupation nonetheless can still contribute to COPD onset or progression. And in non-smokers, of course, the proportion is higher and that smoking and vapors, gas, dust, and fume appear to act add additively. There's not evidence of synergy in the sense that we think about it for asbestos and smoking for lung cancer, for example. The policy implications, uh, I think, is that given this consistency, the strength, and the biological plausibility, uh, occupational exposure is causally related to COPD. This is a worldwide problem. Uh, and we could reduce the burden by 14% or so if we eliminated these occupational exposures, even more so in non-smokers. Again, just visually, this is a pie. Of course, the biggest piece of the pie is smoking. I'm not arguing to the contrary, but 
the occupational piece is far from trivial. And I, as those of you who know me know that I do have a historical bent. So I just want to say this is, I'm saying all this like it's so new, but uh, based on data from the 1930s, Goodman uh, uh, recognized that dusty trades, even within social class are linked to bronchitis mortality and Fletcher, the uh, grandfather of, uh, of COPD recognized uh, emphysema in, uh, and bronchitis in coal workers. I've had a number of collaborators in these studies that I'd like to acknowledge. And uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Block, for that excellent review and presentation. Um, we, let's see, we have, your one comment from the Q&A is awesome talk from Chris Carlson. So um, where, where do you see, let me, let me take prerogative here and, and just ask you one question, Paul, where do you see um, research going in um, occupational, um, uh, you know, COPD? What do you, what do you think is important that, that uh, needs further attention? Well, I think our data are still quite limited on occupation as an exacerbating factor in COPD once it's established. So um, the question of tertiary prevention, I think is important. That would be one question. I think that the possibility of interactions which are more than additive may, is possible in certain, in certain occupations uh, and um, I, I think that it's also important as people get more and more uh, attentive to genetic components of disease that they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, in terms of thinking that that really explains anything. And I, that's why I want, What's well, one reason why I started off with the first case? You couldn't have a, a, a more clear genetic risk factor than alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. But in fact, there's very little data that's been done in an epidemiologic sense on occupational factors in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Okay. Well, I think we, we need to move on, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Blanc for that, that presentation and um, you're most welcome. A great way to start the webinar. I want to move on to um, the uh, the um, presentations on case studies related to um, diagnosing and managing work related COPD. Um, and and our first of three presentations is by Dr. Susan Tarlow, professor at the University of Toronto and who will be uh, addressing probable work-relatedness. And if you could share your slides, uh, Susan, that'd be great. Ah, excellent. Okay, I'm just uh, hoping that this, can you see uh, my screen? Yes, looks Very good. Cool. Okay. So first, I'd like to thank you very much, um, Paul, for inviting me to participate in this. And uh, I'm bringing this very much back to the individual patient level. Uh, Paul showed a good example of uh, um, a case presentation, and uh, uh, my component will also focus on individual case studies just to illustrate um, some of the aspects of these. Uh, here are my disclosures. Um, just going to... uh, so I have no financial relationships with relevant companies. Uh, I do patient consultations at the request of the Ontario Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, and I have funding from them for a systematic review of occupational COPD that has recently been started. 
Um, I'm also a committee member uh, with the American Academy of Allergy and uh, a task force member um, on some task forces with the European Academy of Allergy. So my objectives uh, are using case examples to hopefully understand the definition and possible diagnostic considerations for work-related COPD, and to understand the importance where possible of a multidisciplinary approach to diagnosis and management of these patients. And thirdly, to understand possible preventive strategies for patients who have occupational COPD. So some of the clinical issues to consider are the question of a, a clinical case definition um, as compared with the epidemiologic definitions that, that Paul has shown. Um, and this is uh, often somewhat difficult um, as I'll illustrate in a moment. Uh, some, another issue um, is, it is to look at the causes and range of occupational risks. Uh, should we be focusing in the clinic on specific occupations and or focusing on uh, VGDF, vapor, gas, dust, and fumes, um, as has been suggested. Uh, it's important to consider uh, in this disease appropriate, appropriate latency and appropriate duration of exposure and there are no clear fixed cutoffs for these um, of which I'm aware, but certainly this is not an acute phenomenon. This usually results from um, quite prolonged uh, exposure uh, with an appropriate latency period. There certainly can be confounding factors to the diagnosis and risk factors, uh, as was pointed out, smoking uh, by far the major factor uh, but also uh, underlying HP and asthma and other factors, as I'll show in a moment. And then it's important, of course, initially to have uh, a, an accurate clinical diagnosis of COPD and to consider other diagnoses and overlap syndromes. So there are a number of different differential diagnoses for COPD, and COPD is not a single disease. It can coexist or overlap. Uh, with other conditions. One factor that certainly should be considered is dyssynaptic growth um, and early life events that can be a cause of spirometric fixed airflow limitation. Uh, and this uh, is certainly important to consider. Um, asthma that may result in a component of irreversible airflow limitation um, or there may be an asthmatic or reversible component to COPD. And this has been termed asthma COPD overlap. Chronic bronchiolitis, uh, for example, from nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, or from popcorn butter flavoring. Um, and in addition, smoking related airway disease usually starts in bronchioles as bronchiolitis. Bronchiectasis uh, also can certainly uh, cause uh, fixed airflow limitation. Uh, so a good clinical evaluation is needed to identify uh, these uh, conditions and determine if this is typical COPD or if there are other conditions mimicking this or uh, occurring in addition to this. Um, this shows some of the risk factors for COPD um, as uh, adapted from an old uh, uh, global initiative for CO, chronic obstructive lung disease slide from 2013. Um, but this really hasn't changed, I don't think, over the years. Certainly genetic factors can be important as illustrated by Paul with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, exposure to particles is certainly a risk factor as part of VGDF, uh, including tobacco smoke as a, a major factor, occupational dusts, organic and inorganic, um, air pollution, 
uh, indoor and outdoor. Other risk factors, uh, as uh, well recognized, uh, include lung growth and development, uh, gender, age, respiratory infections, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, asthma and bronchial hyperreactivity, and simple chronic bronchitis has been recognized as a risk factor for development of chronic obstructive lung disease. So there are multiple risk factors in addition to occupational <clears throat> uh, dusts and VGDF. So in a simple clinical way, COPD can be considered in an individual as COPD that's caused in whole or in part by occupational exposures. And this is my first case example. <clears throat> and I should uh, start by thanking the three patients who have given me permission uh, to present their cases in an anonymized way. So the first patient uh, was age 53 at the time of presentation, uh, initially in 2006. Uh, he had smoked only two or three cigarettes a day for 20 years and quit 12 years before he presented. He had worked as a welder for 23 years uh, in subway tunnels where there was exposure to dusts, including asbestos, uh, welding fumes, and diesel fumes. And this included stainless steel welding fumes and manganese. Uh, he wore a shield if he was doing any welding, uh, but didn't routinely wear uh, respiratory protective equipment at work. He had developed progressive shortness of breath uh, for two years prior to presentation, uh, and was at that time short of breath climbing around 10 steps. He also had a cough and clear sputum production when at work. This shows his spirometry <clears throat> uh, with an FEV1 47% of predicted and an FEV1 FVC ratio 40%, showing uh, severe airflow limitation. He did have uh, a significant bronchodilator response uh, increasing uh, his FEV1 by 14% uh, and over 200 ml after a bronchodilator, but still had uh, significant airflow limitation post bronchodilator. He had moderate hyperinflation, severe gas trapping, and a normal diffusing capacity. Allergy skin tests were all negative. Uh, peak flow readings. Uh, on a serial basis showed no significant variability, but was slightly higher after taking a bronchodilator. A CT scan of his chest uh, showed mosaic attenuation, uh, bronchial wall thickening and mucus plugs, but no asbestos related changes. And this shows uh, uh, mosaic attenuation on his CT scan. A diagnosis uh, was made of occupational COPD with a reversible component and likely a uh, component of bronchiolitis. He changed his work to outdoor delivery for the same employer and uh, was treated uh, with pharmacologic agents for his COPD. On follow-up, um, his FEV1 uh, was slightly higher, 58% of predicted as compared with 48% of predicted at initially, uh, but he still had significant airflow limitation, FEV1 FVC ratio 46%, and no further bronchodilator response. Symptomatically, uh, he improved his cough and sputum cleared with outdoor work, and he remained stable. In terms of um, further documentation, um, a chart review was performed to confirm the smoking history that he had given um, and, uh, and confirmed uh, his reports. Uh, he was found to have light, very likely uh, significant VGDF exposure, vapor gas, dust, and fumes, as confirmed by an occupational hygiene assessment of his workplace. And his claim for workers' compensation was accepted for occupational COPD. 
This shows uh, his follow-up uh, spirometry uh, from 2006 to 2022, just showing he has remained very stable. Um, the FEV1 shown in the red line initially improved slightly and then stayed stable over this long period of time, as did his uh, FEV1 FVC ratio. Uh, the second patient is a 57-year-old man, uh, initially seen in 2017. Uh, he was born in Vietnam, uh, came to Canada at the age of 17, and um, has worked since 1983 in a factory making polyurethane foam on different lines in the factory. He had a smoking history of five pack years and quit in 1985. Um, he reported a cough for the past three or four years um, that was mostly dry, but he had gray sputum in the mornings when he was working on some lines and had minimal exercise limitation. His physical examination was normal. Um, because he was working in a company um, using isocyanates, he was part of a workplace medical surveillance program that included um, a respiratory questionnaire and spirometry. And uh, so we had the benefit uh, of uh, being able to see some of his previous spirometry uh, back to 2011. And as you can see on this slide, uh, he had a progressive decline in his FEV1 uh, from 2011 to 2017, uh, falling from 75% of predicted to 67% of predicted, and the FEV1 FVC ratio falling from 67% of predicted in 2011 to 56% of predicted, uh, sorry, to 65, 50, from 67% to 56% in 2017. He had no significant bronchodilator response. At the time he was seen in 2017, um, a chest x-ray was requested, uh, but uh, he was seen at the end of the day and the x-ray was not performed on the day of his visit. His exposure um, was estimated at 34 years of exposure uh, to vapor, gas, dust, and fumes in the factory. There was um, an occupational hygiene assessment performed uh, to determine his likely exposure. And this was estimated at a particle exposure of 3.5 to 7 milligram per meter cubed uh, over the years. TDI and MDI isocyanates were estimated at, at being below five parts per billion, except possibly for short exposures such as spills. Uh, but note was made, in, this may have been underestimated due to the method used um, during part uh, of this time. A compensation claim was submitted for work-related COPD. Uh, in his previous chest X-ray uh, from the start of this time around 2011, had shown right apical scarring suggestive of old granulomatous disease. And by January 2016, a repeat chest X-ray was unchanged. However, uh, two weeks after I initially saw him, uh, he developed an increase, acute increase in cough shortness of breath, fever, fatigue, and was found to, on chest X-ray at that time to have a right middle lobe infiltrate and ac an acute right pleural effusion that was drained and found to be positive for uh, tuberculosis. Sensitive to triple therapy for which he was then treated for a year. And this shows his chest X-rays uh, from that time on the left-hand side uh, with the infiltrate on C shown on CT scan, uh, and then the follow-up uh, imaging with resolution of this, uh, but remaining um, uh, shadowing in the right apex that had been present before. 
So his claim for work-related COPD was accepted, but questions were raised about the role of tuberculosis and whether this may have played a part uh, in causing his uh, occupational, uh, in causing his uh, obstructive changes uh, on spirometry. Looking back at his previous uh, results, and was, it was very helpful to have the old results and, she, and see the progression of his changes. And overall, it was considered that this was unrelated to his COPD um, and unrelated to the, the, and that the tuberculosis was unrelated to his work. Uh, he was treated um, with an anticholinergic agent for his COPD and PRN short acting bronchodilator. Uh, he had clearing of his changes of tuberculosis with treatment. And at five year follow up, his spirometry has been extremely stable, almost identical. Uh, to the time when I initially saw him in 2017. He has continued work, but has uh, been able to work with the same employer uh, in relatively clean parts uh, of the company. So those two cases um, both had a very stable outcome of their COPD on relatively long follow-up after moving to cleaner jobs at work. In contrast, um, the third case uh, is somewhat different. And this is a 47 year old man who was a welder for 23 years with various company companies doing MIG and TIG welding, mainly with aluminum and steel. Uh, he also had silica exposure in some of his previous workplaces. Uh, he had worn an N95 respirator in addition to the welding shield, but was not, it was not fit tested and he does have a beard. Uh, he had noted shortness of breath on exertion for one and a half years with a morning cough and clear sputum, wheezing and chest tightness. He was a lifelong non-smoker and was non-atopic. Uh, he did have a high BMI and obstructive sleep apnea for which he used CPAP. Uh, his initial um, spirometry at the time of clinic presentation, again, showed significant airflow limitation. His FEV1 was 48% of predicted pre-bronchodilator uh, with an FVC 95% of predicted. He did have uh, some reversibility uh, with a post-bronchodilator FEV1, 65% of predicted. He had findings of hyperinflation and a borderline reduction in diffusing capacity. His chest X-ray um, showed hyperinflation, and he also had uh, on chest X-ray and CT scan uh, diffuse small nodules and mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Um, an EBUS um, and a, and a bronchial ultrasound biopsy uh, showed findings of silicosis. So again, this was not a single diagnosis in this patient. Um, he had findings objectively of silicosis. Uh, he had obstructive lung disease with a reversible component or ACO. Um, and from history, it appeared likely that this was that there was a work-related component uh, to his COPD. Uh, his claim was accepted for this um, by uh, the Workplace Safety Insurance Board, both for the silicosis and the COPD component. Again, he was treated um, appropriately for COPD. Uh, he was removed. Uh, from uh, his job and with support from the compensation system, uh, he changed work to being a school bus driver that he really enjoyed. However, despite this change, he has gone on to have a progressive decline in his lung function over the past 10 years since I first saw him. His FEV1 has fallen 50% from his initial visit 
uh, down to 0 0.9 liters with no change post bronchodilator now. And his FEV1 FVC ratio is 24%. Um, he has a TLC 134% with gas trapping and hyperinflation. And his diffusing capacity that was borderline normal has fallen now to 38%. He now needs supplemental oxygen on exertion and is being worked up for a lung, possible lung transplant. He has a normal alpha-1 antitrypsin level. Uh, he has not had frequent exacerbations um, during the past 10 years, but has just steadily uh, declined in his lung function. And it's unclear uh, what is the reason for this decline, um, whether it's related to silica airway effects, um, whether there are genetic factors not identified, and possibly a role of uh, the bus exhaust fumes, uh, but he really doesn't feel that he has significant exposure uh, in his um, driving the bus to the exhaust fumes. So in summary from these cases, so. This shows the variability that can occur in outcome uh, from uh, COPD, similar to what previously was described by Fletcher and Peter many years ago with smoking-related uh, COPD, even after quitting smoking. In this case, um, the work exposure was changed and with good outcome for two of the three patients, but the third has had progressive worsening. I think these cases also illustrate um, that there can be a useful role of allied health um, in uh, diagnosis and management of work-related COPD, um, both in terms of workplace medical surveillance, uh, the role of occupational hygienists in assessing exposure um, in individual patients or through the compensation system, uh, and uh, a return to work coordinator can be very helpful to identify uh, appropriate uh, accommodation for future work for these patients. In conclusion, uh, the clinical diagnosis can be relatively uncomplicated. Uh, if there is COPD in a non-smoker with VGDF exposure, and if, if there are no other possible causes of COPD, However, in real life, it can be very complicated. Uh, significant smoking can increase relative risks of work-related COPD, but this does make the diagnosis more difficult, as can other risk factors. And clinical algorithms in the future might be helpful to weigh the attribution from different factors. Objective confirmation of smoking and other history uh, and exposures are important in the individual patient when possible. And longitudinal uh, pulmonary function, both for surveillance or for follow-up, uh, can also be very helpful um, to uh, provide appropriate management for these patients. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tarlow. That was a uh... A very interesting deep dive into clinical cases and um, very insightful. I encourage everyone, if you have questions, to use the Q&A function. We will have a Q&A session after the next two presentations. Well, our next presenter will, will also uh, be talking about um, attribution of work-relatedness for COPD cases. Um, and our speaker is Dr. David Fishwick who is uh, an honorary professor at the University of Sheffield in, in the United Kingdom. So we're going from Canada, transported across the ocean to the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Fishwick also has other uh, uh, appointments, um, but let's turn it over to you. And uh, th thank you for uh, taking part today. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I must say, from an absolutely beautiful autumn evening in, in Sheffield. So thank you so much for the opportunity to take part and for the, the invite as well. Um, I don't have any formal conflicts of interest to share with you, Paul, at all. Um, I speak in my capacity as a researcher 
primarily and as a clinician. I also do work for the Health and Safety Executive, which is the UK GB workplace regulator. But obviously, the opinions that I give um, around this subject are pretty much mine and not necessarily those of um, those who are employing me. Um, Paul Locke has already fantastically set the scene in relation to why on earth we're all at this seminar. Um, decades ago, there were a lot of doubts around the links between work and COPD. And I think I get the feeling from the mood music in a sense that this is becoming much more accepted. So I'm not going to dwell at all on the, on the first, first bullet point here particularly. However, Susan has beautifully demonstrated that it remains extremely difficult. And this is what we're finding in, in the UK to identify specific occupational contributors to COPD at the worker level. So when you're sat in clinic with an individual who's um, slamming their fist on the table saying, well, I know it was my work, when you're in the knowledge of their pack year history and so on, it becomes extremely difficult. And yet, I suspect this knowledge is going to be so important to us collectively if we're going to be defining workplace interventions, because clearly inter interventions have got to be defined to reduce exposures to the hazards, to reduce the risk of COPD. But we can only do that if um, we know what they are specifically. And a lot of Sheffield and UK workplaces still contain multiple mixed hazards, as was beautifully shown in uh, at least one of Susan's cases. So, you know, I guess my feeling is, in other words, with multiple potential candidates of harm, uh, it, to the lung, is it actually possible ever to get to the position in the individual of defining um, a likely case of occupational COPD or indeed um, attributing um, proportions of what was important in an individual case? And clearly in the UK and around the world that may have future ramifications for compensation and, and also defining interventions. And just to perhaps put this pictorially, this bloke with COPD, he's probably carrying one known risk factor, but if he's a smoker and has a family history and maybe PIMZ, then what is truly at the heart of causing this, this horrific condition? Um, Susan has shown some really interesting cases. I think sometimes it is a little clearer. Um, and I've had many years from the grey hairs on my head of um, clinical practice in Sheffield, which is an absolutely fascinating city um, at the southwest part of the South Yorkshire coalfield, where we have a mix of extremely heavily exposed individuals, not just to dirty jobs, but also to coal specifically, uh, and also in, in the steelworks. So this, um, this chest X-ray was taken the night before this patient sadly died. He died a number of years ago now. And for those of you who've started to soak in the, um, the detective work on this X-ray, you can see an ECG lead. You can see clips holding that on. You can see his oxygen mask. For those of you who've already started to work out why he died, you would probably say, okay, David, he's a little bit hyper expanded. He may have um, some inflammatory shadowing down at that right base that would be consistent with a bronchopneumonia. And you'd be right. And in fact, he was certified dead the next day. You can see this is many years ago. Um, he was 72, year olds when he, 72 years old when he died. And, you know, sort of broadly speaking, um, his post-mortem findings were entirely consistent with COPD and super added infection, you can see there. And we had pus literally coming out of his main bronchi and the histology didn't show any, any surprises. This gent in life had, other than being a lovely man and was caring for his Down syndrome daughter and wife who had bronchiectasis, was a very light smoker. Now, you're going to ask me to, to define the term very light. I do live and work in Sheffield. 
And I'll show you on the next slide his pack year estimates, but I can assure you that in Sheffield that would be regarded in his occupational set as being a pretty, pretty light smoker. So we had 12 pack years of smoking. Maybe um, many of you on the call wouldn't regard that as being particularly light. He had, however, um, definitely put his hand up to five years worth of um, vapors, gases, dust and fume exposure. More specifically, um, he'd had at least 10 years of cadmium fume exposure, particularly, and also interestingly, um, 10 years silver fume exposure. He, um, as an aside, was argyric. He had a blue face. The nurses used to talk to him about this as he walked down the corridor. It was a very striking appearance that he attributed to those sort of years of um, working over a, um, a silver fume output from the machine. Hopefully you're all beginning to get your views developed about whether or not you felt this gent had occupational COPD. I was quite um, enthused by this. The coroner in the UK um, decided to take this case. Um, which is not absolutely mandatory for people with COPD, where there may be a link into occupation. And the coroner um, gave me these um, normal values for uh, liver and renal cadmium. And you can see that these are purely a reflection of the fact that this gent had been, you know, presumably exposed quite heavily, um, which would tie in nicely uh, with, his, with his occupational history. And his CT scan there, you can see, is full of holes consistent with what we knew he had and what was histologically proven um, at his postmortem and that of emphysema. And it's interesting to note some of the work that Paul was talking about in relation to the, the increasing predominance of the evidence base around emphysema rather than the mixed term of um, CO, COPD. So um, the coroner permitted me um, to certify the cause of death as bronchopneumonia due to COPD, but also to particularly place uh, cadmium exposure on that list um, as well. This sort of gets you thinking a little bit, doesn't it? Here's our blue argyric man then. What's gonna happen there? Um, if you stick with me just a moment and think about normal lung function at the top of that bar, then you have to get down a certain level to become a case of anything. But in COPD, it's rather more straightforward because um, COPD is predominantly defined by physiological impairment. So getting down to that bar, let's call that the FEV1, FVC ratio. And I suspect that in this man, reduction in his lung function due to non-occupational factors might, might not have done it enough. In other words, had he just smoked, in quotes, he might not have made it to a case of COPD. And it probably was the combination, as Paul alluded to, of his occupational and non-occupational factors that rendered him the case. But, you know, how on earth do we go about unraveling what I still believe is an extremely complicated landscape here? I think, to be fair, that was the central tenet of what we were all trying to achieve under Paul's fantastic recent guidance when we all got together to um, construct the most recent ATS and ERS um, statement. But what I'd like to do, Paul, just in the last few um, moments of the talk is just to think a little bit more about the individual. Rather than looking at epi studies and rather than looking at odds ratios, I wanted to share with you just a little bit of work that we did that was specifically designed to look at the other end of this. In other words, given the, the detail of the types of cases that Paul and Susan have already shown, what do experts in the field actually think about it? And you can see there the names of some of the individuals that, that took part in this study. And for those of you who are interested, it's out there in peer review press, and it's rather old now. I'm just looking at it, it was about nine years old. And I suspect very strongly if we did the same again, we get a very, very different answer. So what did we do? Basically, we identified 12 COPD experts. Um, they didn't have to be based in the UK. And we also identified 12 occupational lung disease experts. And 
Again, they didn't have to be necessarily based in the UK. We used a, a matrix, effectively a three by three, of making sure that when we were creating these hypothetical cases, that they were a mix. They were a mix of low, medium, and high smoking histories, and they were a mix of low, medium, and high occupational histories. Of course, although we did not announce to the raters that were going to look at these 15 cases, uh, you know, what categories they lay in, it was, it was fairly evident that's exactly what, what they were. And just to give you an example, the table below gives you um, case one. And this was um, defined to be in the high smoking category. You can see there are 65 pack years. That's a good going pack year history, even for Sheffield. Um, and a high occupational exposure. And you can see there that we had placed this gent at 14 years of scrap metal work, 19 years of foundry work, 10 years of being a patron decorator, by no means an atypical occupational history in the sort of patients we're seeing in clinic. And we had forced this man down to um, a rather low FEV1 at 33% of predicted. We did have the option to give other information, and I'll give an example in a moment, but in this case, we didn't elect to, to do that. And what we then did with those 15 hypothetical cases was just to ask those experts to rate the cause of COPD in each case. And the way we did it was to give um, the raters three categories, the smoking category, an occupational category, and an other category. And um, raters were given very little instruction other than to say that you had to rate each of those boxes in each case between naught and 100%. Um, and actually quite illuminatingly, um, we also asked them to make some open-ended comments and we did do some uh, relatively limited qualitative analysis of that. But actually some of the qualitative comments have really chimed with some of the um, expert view that we've heard already in this webinar from Paul and Susan about where we're going next with this condition. So, first thing to say is that the ratings varied very, very widely. There wasn't a fair, there wasn't a clear, tight consensus around any case. Um, the other category was only used as an exception. If Paul had shown or included his real PIZZ case, I suspect we would have had the other category very clearly documented there. One of our cases we did have PIMZ in and the other category was, was rated there. But smoking, tobacco smoking was absolutely consistently rated um, as the strongest contributor, except for what you might expect, the high occupational exposure, low smoking category. But interestingly, in the high occupational exposure, high smoking category, the raters were absolutely trumping it um, and saying smoking was the absolute predominant cause. Here's a couple of examples. Um, I give you the first case, which I've shown you already. Um, this was the 65 pack year man with the very significant um, occupational history. And you can see there that there, were, um, there was a massive predominance for cigarette smoking, even though this gent had worked in many, many years in a dirty job. And to give you the second um, example, obviously I'm not gonna give you all 15 cases. Um, you can see they're relatively low pack years, um, uh, high occupational exposure there, but also we'd added in silicotic changes on the radiology, both chest X-ray and CT. And it was only at this point did the um, raters break ranks and did they start, as you can see there, with a median there of 70, to start to think more significantly about occupational contribution. Pretty much finally, Paul, um, we did ask about other views and it was clear that the raters didn't feel we'd given them enough information. And the beauty of this is we can replicate this. And in fact, I would love to replicate this study today, but adding in these extra features. They would like information on peak flows to exclude asthma. They would like appearance, CT appearances, and it would be lovely, wouldn't it, to add some in with emphysema and some without. They were very interested in specifics. You know, well, David, what has this person really been exposed to? Have they had silica exposure? Have they been a welder? Have they had cadmium exposure? 
And they were very interested in Paul's notion early on about the additive versus multiplicative components in terms of how they started to rate these cases. Um, a few of the experts had got together a priori and we had weighted the occupational contribution as is shown in the bottom line there. And, you know, you would expect that as the occupational contribution of the case went up, so our raters went up. But what was fascinating was, in my view anyway, the COPD experts were far more likely to rate occupational attribution than the people who were perhaps allegedly more expert. The occupational lung disease experts were being a little bit more conservative. So um, it's my next to last slide. Um, we did show a um, five cases where the, the data were longitudinal. Susan's beautifully shown some real world data here. And this, this is just one example. And it was an example constructed to get people worried that this individual worker was losing their lung function by 105 milliliters every year off FEV1 over sequentially four years. And you can see there that um, most people were concerned, but of the people who weren't concerned, three of those were COPD um, experts. So whilst the occupational experts were less keen to overall attribute occupational attribution, they were more concerned about the declines. And maybe they were more familiar with either ethnicities and others fantastic work in this area, looking at what constitutes an important decline. So where does this leave our, our blue man? Well, I, I guess over the years, we're going to learn more about the gray and blue box, and we're going to learn more about the interactions of these factors in the individual case. So Paul, this is my final slide, I'll be very quick. The notion of attributing COB to workplace exposures, I think is becoming much more widely accepted around the world, and certainly, this is what I feel in the UK. Cigarette smoking, tobacco exposure is still the predominant attributed cause. And in our study, it was only when we flipped the coin and made high occupational exposure issue that people started to think differently. There was a massive variation in rate of use. And as I've said already, the COPD experts were much more likely um, to rate occupation as a cause paradoxically and rather perniciously over um, those who had more interest in occupation. Um, more information was needed. And as I said, I would love to repeat this study. And the longitudinal cases do highlight the need that we, we, we must start to benchmark in our own minds what is important for annual decline and what is not. And Susan's already alluded to it beautifully in terms of how we start to intervene to, to prevent harm. So thanks, Paul. That's all I really wanted to share with you this afternoon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fishrick, for the, uh, uh, that uh, very interesting presentation. I mean, the, the sobering clinical details remind us of the humanity behind the numbers and, and, um, and that, that sometimes we overlook when we, we start just jumping right to the numbers. And also, the, as with your work and also with Susan's uh, presentation, the challenge of, of, uh, of diagnosis is, is ongoing. Uh, our next presenter, Dr. Rafael de Hilojos, is, um, at, is a professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and he will be talking about management of work-related COPD cases. So, Rafael, if you can go ahead, can go yep. ahead and share your screen, your, your presentation. Right. Sure. Let me just do some uh, adjustment here. Okay. I believe uh, I'm. There we go. All right. There we Looks go. Looks good. Thank you. All right. <laughs> That's a miracle. All right. Uh, so I am actually escaping a little bit from the case base uh, precisely because I suspected that uh, uh, both uh, Dr. Tarlow and Fishwick would have stellar cases about which and some of my experience, I could possibly make some comments about what the management of work-related COPD is and what we know about it. And uh, to run to the finish line, I could say we actually know relatively little, but uh, we know certain tools and that's what the purpose of this workshop presumably is to try to look at those opportunities to investigate uh, those risk factors and you know the, the outcomes and the treatments that, that are appropriate for these situations. Um, 
In terms of conflict of interest, I, I have none that is relevant to this presentation, but I always uh, mentioned that I uh, have received research clinical administrative funding uh, for from the Walter Center Health Program of the National Institute of, for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, and nothing that I'm going to say, I think, uh, reflects any views of the, uh, uh, my funding or uh, my uh, those uh, uh, connections that I mentioned. So um, uh, the previous two speakers, or three speakers actually, including Paul, already overstressed the fact that uh, the uh, there is an increasing realization that are non-tobacco related risk factors for COPD, and I'm not going to belabor this, but of course occupational exposures are here. But we there is an increasing body of literature about environmental exposures, not only indoor pollution but also outdoor pollution, including environmental disaster, which is a little bit close to the type of work that I do. Uh, of course, everybody recognizes and the search is on for genetically determined susceptibility factors, uh, factors related to lung development, including the synapses that Dr. Tarlo mentioned, accelerated aging or senescence, and also lung diseases throughout life. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, Dr. Tarlo mentioned uh, cases of asthma, uh, tuberculosis, other infections, and rheumatoid, even rheumatoid arthritis have been shown to uh, make some contribution to the development of COPD. So uh, despite this wide variety of uh, causative factors that uh, we uh, increasingly recognize uh, and all the endo and phenotypes of COPD, there is a scarce evidence that yet suggesting that the therapeutic approaches for COPD with different causative factors differs in any ways, except for a few that I'm going to highlight and that's the purpose, what I consider the purpose of my presentation. Um, part of it, in terms at least of, for the pharmacologic and uh, 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 treatment of COPD, is that uh, most randomized uh, clinical trials have systematically included tobacco smoking as one of their participant inclusion criteria in COPD studies, which for the uh, 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 excellent presentation that have preceded mine, you can surmise that that in itself decreases the chances that occupationally related cases uh, have any likelihood, any substantial likelihood of being included. So uh, no wonder, at least up, uh, up to this point, we have uh, a pretty good excuse to not know much. We could do better though. So uh, in the management of COPD, and I'm not also going to belabor that, but you go through a checklist that is not very different uh, in most COPD cases. Of course, smoking cessation is a very strong risk factor and it's at the top of the, uh, uh, of the uh, number of things that uh, interventions that we have encouraging healthy weight, diet and habits. But curtailment of ongoing occupational and environmental exposures, that's the point that I wanted to make, is that whether you think that the case is occupationally related or not, uh, you still have to think about those occupational exposures that might have a bearing on how the patient is doing and the considerations uh, um, uh, from the uh, uh, occupational point of view to try to maintain those individuals active, even if you think that occupation had nothing to do with the causation. So that's one point that I wanted to make and you know, and that's why I included it in the management of all COPD. We have, uh, you know, uh, we have entire uh, symposia related to the pharmacologic treatment uh, of COPD um, with the uh, uh, classes of medications that we've known and that have been referred to by the previous speakers, appropriate vaccinations, treatment or prevention of a disease worsening comorbidities, uh, supplemental oxygen and pulmonary rehabilitation when appropriate, and in selected cases, surgical or bronchoscopic lung volume reduction procedures, or even lung transplantation, and all of that one way or the other has been illustrated by some of the cases that have been mentioned up to now. Uh, Dr. Tarlo mentioned uh, the fact that we uh, recognize uh, the overlap and sometimes uh, difficult differential diagnosis between asthma and COPD and the existence of uh, the overlap um, where uh, all that we know is that uh, perhaps uh, the use of inhaled corticosteroids uh, may be a, a little bit more 
prominent that it is for COPD alone, but that says, you know, a, 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 a difference of intensity and uh, not a very clear cut one. And uh, the same for other medications that might be uh, more appropriately using asthma and COPD. But other than that, the treatment is really not very different. Uh, I had an interest in what uh, 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 has been mentioned up to now in chronic uh, bronchitis, or what I call just to be uh, more specific about chronic nonspecific or non obstructive bronchitis, because we actually this is also an entity that is often excluded from clinical trials. And uh, I suspect, however, that the approach is similar to that for ACO in the sense that uh, there is an inflammatory, proximal airway inflammatory component that tends to require the use of inhaled corticosteroid, but I have no data right now to really suggest, you know, uh, uh, demonstrate that. But we all know, and there are, uh, uh, there was an excellent publication um, by Prescott Woodruff in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago that showed that regardless where the randomized controlled clinical trials are, clinicians already know, and they know very well that these patients need to be treated and that they require just as intense a treatment as those of COPD. So when we go to work-related COPD, uh, of course, uh, besides uh, what I mentioned already about the curtailment of occupational or mitigation of occupational and environmental exposures, that we have other functions to uh, fulfill as occupational uh, pulmonologists. And uh, if applicable, and it has been mentioned already, and that's why don't need, thankfully, to belabor this point. There are issues of workers' compensation reporting, particularly if the if the worker still uh, in in his productive years of life, and uh, there needs to be some accommodations, or there could be uh, some partial income replacement if he has or she has to uh, move to an occupation that is less paying. Uh, the, depending on local requ requirements, there are registry uh, reporting obligations. And I just wanted to show as an example here in the state of New York, uh, the Department of Health of the state has an occupational lung disease registry. And among the diseases that are to be uh, reported, uh, there is a, a, a chronic occupational bronchitis, COPD, and asthma be besides silicosis, and essentially any occupational lung disease. Uh, again, re re depending on uh, jurisdictions, uh, localities, and uh, regulations, there, there are some other public health uh, reporting obligations. If there are concerns about safety in workplaces, uh, for example, in the, in the United States, we have an obligation as physicians to report to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, in order to prevent further disease in others that are employed in similar uh, occupations to the case that we have identified. And whenever we have a concern and uh, literature has shown the results of the health hazard evaluations by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in this country, when there is a concern about clusters of disease uh, with exposures that are not very well known or characterized. And there is this recourse that can be used in this country to see if it could be evaluated by the experts uh, in, the, uh, in NIOSH. So uh, I mentioned before, uh, there is the uh, curtailment or mitigation of occupational and environmental exposures. And of course, that follows the, uh, this figure that has uh, been reproduced in uh, uh, thousands probably of publications of the hierarchy of controls based on effectiveness uh, in protecting individuals going from elimination to substitution to engineering control, administrative controls, and last, uh, personal protective equipment, something that we saw completely inverted with the recent pandemic, but that's uh, not the subject of this particular talk. So the elimination of positive uh, elimination refers to uh, physically removing the hazard or through legislation, you know, to uh, when uh, there is banning of uh, hazardous agents. Substitution, uh, 
is when uh, we find a replacement for the hazard of something that is uh, less hazardous. Uh, so presumably uh, we could achieve a reduction in uh, the uh, uh, risk related to that occupation. Engineering controls is, uh, consist essentially in isolating workers from the hazard. So containment and casing uh, 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 dust control operations uh, are all within this category. And administrative controls are also always require a, a, a quite a bit of creativity, so they tend to be neglected, but they is to change the way workers do their tasks to, in order to reduce their exposures, uh, regu you know, regulatory uh, uh, occupational exposure limit enforcement, and uh, importantly, worker training and education. Uh, you can think of any measures that are very good, but if you don't convince the worker that they can help uh, him or her, you are not going to achieve anything with them. So in practice, uh, less effective methods are often necessary, and that's why I left for last uh, the uh, respiratory protection and the respiratory protective equipment. The, uh, the, the one in, in, you know, in, in practicality, and I just read it, uh, you know, as usual, a very good article by David Fishwick about it, uh, that uh, reality uh, actually imposes sometimes uh, the um, uh, obvious uh, 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 decision that that is, um, uh, you know, the best that we can do under certain circumstances. But as long as we understand that uh, protective, uh, uh, respiratory protective equipment is requires proper fitting and training, uh, that there can be, there can be uh, a lot of limitations related to the equipment, availability, supplies, proper maintenance, and the COVID pandemic actually showed us some of that, and that there are a number of behavioral factors related to the, uh, uh, to the workers themselves and their uh, motivation that need to be um, paid attention to. So um, the, in general, uh, the prevention of occupational lung disease and occupational COPD for that matter, uh, also requires physicians abilities in early recognition of occupational agents when diagnosing uh, an unusual disease manifestation or a cluster of a common disease. And there was a question in the chat about that. And of course, as occupational physicians, and uh, we worry about uh, uh, primary prevention, secondary and tertiary prevention measures. And we have occupational screening and surveillance um, as uh, another intervention in trying to uh, prevent uh, occupational COPD. We, uh, after this classic, uh, Fletcher was already mentioned in this uh, uh, segment of the webinar, uh, uh, that actually suggested that COPD was uh, uh, an inexorably uh, lung function declining uh, disease. We now know have a more nuanced view of uh, what uh, COPD does. And we actually recognize that some individuals with COPD actually have a relatively normal rate of decline. Regardless, that doesn't decrease the value of longitudinal spirometry. We just have to improve how to do it and how to implement it. And that is what technically uh, may offer some uh, challenges, but uh, that we need to overcome. I just wanted to show here an example of a occupational cohort that we follow of the former World Trade Center workers, where we show the longitudinal uh, spirometry uh, analysis, where we have the majority of people with a relatively normal uh, uh, age-related uh, uh, the rate of declining their FEV1, but we recognize a number of people who are crashing uh, and um, uh, markedly. If we didn't, if we didn't analyze this uh, by subgroups, we wouldn't notice these uh, subgroups that are uh, are actually a higher risk. But also, uh, we 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 notice some some people who are actually improving. In the case of the World Trade Center, we think is because uh, there is a. a, a uh, uh, an acute exposure uh, and that the inflammation from that has actually uh, shown some uh, improvement in subgroups of people and we are particularly interested in that. 
at, as a result of something like that, for, uh, we, we could show this is in press right now. We presented it last year, the uh, European Refractory Society meeting as an abstract of it results of a uh, data on 18,000 of these workers, uh, it, where we identified a, a number of cases of COPD uh, or that fit a, a spirometric definition of uh, asthma COPD overlap, not quite dissimilar to what Dr. Tarlo mentioned before, except that we require uh, an FEV1 response that was uh, of a, you know, a larger magnitude because COPD by itself can produce uh, a 200 ml change. But in any case, whatever the definition, we could identify those cases and could, were able to, uh, uh, to suggest that the uh, early arrival at the site actually has something to do with uh, the concession to, uh, going back to and tying it with the issue of attribution uh, that uh, at the group level is a little bit uh, easier than at the individual level. And uh, longitudinal spirometric surveillance, uh, as I said, we had some tools for that. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health in the United States uh, produce and, and continues to refine this uh, 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 software that is freely available on the internet. And I just wanted to show you how it, how it looks uh, in, in, the, in the on the internet uh, for uh, download uh, to try to uh, uh, assist occupational physicians in the uh, use of a, a spirometry, the longitudinal spirometry for detection of diseases. And uh, but that's not just all that you need. You always need pre-placement, uh, baseline uh, examinations, followed by periodic uh, medical evaluations. And the value of that has been illustrated at least by one of the cases that Dr. Tarlo uh, presented. Uh, you need technically very adequate spirometry protocols. It, uh, I won't belabor that point because that in and of itself would take a whole day. Uh, they have to be appropriate uh, medical records and competent occupational uh, medical oversight. Uh, data is data. You still need to interpret it appropriately and rapidly. And uh, these programs need to be associated with general health promotion, including, of course, and it has been made evident by the cases presented up to now, is smoking cessation, because it is pervasive and is uh, often coexistent with those occupational factors that we worry about. I just wanted to mention that uh, Dr. Blank mentioned in this study, I believe, uh, but essentially just to say that um, a, a exposure to uh, vapor gas dust and fumes and uh, are usually associated with a greater risk of a very uh, specific uh, adverse outcomes in COPD patients, uh, like restricted activity, emergency uh, room visit, and hospitalization, and the odds ratios are sufficiently um, convincing in that respect. And uh, that in general among COPD patients, Greater occupational exposure uh, was associated with outcomes that we use in randomized clinical trials often, such as uh, walk distance, uh, dyspnea scale, quality of life, like instruments that are uh, as very well known to everybody in that reads the COPD literature. And so um, in, it has been, uh, 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 studies are uh, uh, relatively scarce on the uh, protective effect of re respirators on lung function. This is a study that is now 20 years old. Uh, it it was done at NIOSH uh, and it was a relatively small study, 185 uh, US uh, coal miners that had exams five years apart in 87 and 92. And uh, it was shown that, uh, just to run to the uh, 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 bottom line here, that uh, the respirator use uh, uh, seemed to be associated with a statistically significant higher FEV1 at both uh, uh, examination times, 87 and 82. But the slope, you know, uh, the rate of decline didn't seem to change. So it has been difficult to prove uh, that uh, you know, the magnitude of the uh, health, but you know, these are small studies and better and larger studies are certainly needed. So uh, I just wanted to conclude by mentioning uh, 
that um, because this is a, a webinar about research needs and opportunities that um, we are at to preempt Dr. Henneberger's uh, question. <laughs> so hopefully uh, we hope to see inclusion of non-smokers into COPD trials or uh, remove the smoking uh, uh, requirement into those trials as uh, some of that is already occurring. Um, adding past and, and current occupational exposure data to those trials, even if they are more concerned about a specific uh, bronchodilator or inhaled corticosteroid, uh, and so that uh, we can conduct post hoc uh, analysis of subgroups of occupationally exposed uh, participants. And on our side, we, we are just as guilty of that. You know, we, have to, we are on the occupational side, but we often uh, forget to include therapeutic and treatment outcome data in our occupational cohorts. And uh, I say that from uh, uh, telling you that with the Walter Center uh, cohort, we have done a, you know, nothing so far, and we should. So with that, I hope that I haven't exceeded my time, which would be exceptional, and um, open for any questions that, um, or discussions or concerns that might be, and I'm open to any uh, direct communication that you might have about this uh, subject that uh, greatly interests me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Rafael, for that. Um very interesting presentation and, and thank you for bringing up issues of uh, particularly of longitudinal monitoring and, and uh, the challenges of, of treatment and management of, of COPD cases. So we're at the point now of, of the uh, question and answer um, uh, session uh, for this uh, first section. And, and we do already have a few questions in the um, Q&A uh, uh, function uh, and audience members are welcome to put in more uh, uh, questions or comments. I will start with with one, um, and it was originally uh, directed to Drs. Blanc and Tarlow, um, but I, I, others are welcome to jump in. It says, given the insidious onset and very slow progression of COPD. What is the role and benefit of annual medical surveillance with lung function screening and preventing onset? So any of you can jump in. Uh, well, I I, th I I I hope to have answer actually because I saw that question before my mm -hmm. uh, mine came and that's precisely I say I'm happy because I included something about that. I believe that uh, at, at least in certain uh, occupations that have a relatively high risk, like um, you know you, you could think which ones of those are, but uh, that there should be that type of surveillance uh, that uh, that 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 there is a benefit in doing that and that uh, it should be accompanied with health promotion um, uh, uh, measures to add value to them. Uh, so that's what I would say. I think that uh, it has been responded actually in all uh, uh, three uh, circumstances. Or one of the cases, I believe it was a case of Dr. Tarlow that had the benefit of having had that information available precisely to be able to determine uh, when he was, the patient was already deceased that, uh, that that actually had happened. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's very helpful to be able to look back at that kind of data. Other, otherwise, it's very difficult to know whether there just may have been dyssynaptic growth causing the, the changes, unless you then follow the patient prospectively, which obviously takes many years. But in terms of uh, selecting occupations to do workplace uh, spirometry, I think it would be quite difficult given the VGDF <laughs> uh, is, is so ubiquitous. Um, I mean, it, in Ontario, um, spirometry use, surveillance spirometry used to be done for minors for silicosis as part of the surveillance program with, with regular chest x-rays, but uh, the focus was really on silicosis rather than detecting airway changes. And I, I don't know if anything, this was years ago, I don't know if, if anything was really done with the um, airway changes at that time. 
and then the the program was disbanded with with better conditions down the mine. So, but I think that um, uh, silica, silica exposure, I think, is is a I, I would think is a significant risk factor that might be good to to focus on. And welding, as as David suggested in his um, case examples, I, I don't know if there are other situations that you would think that um, surveillance would be helpful or practical. Uh, Susan and Paul, just from the UK perspective, I think this has been exercised quite a bit in terms of discussion. And I think asthma is a well understood disease that we apply health surveillance in workplaces. And there are generally four rules um, that an exposure causes harm, um, that the test, there is a test to detect that harm. Um, it's likely that some damage will occur in the workplace and that overall the system will benefit workers. So I'll leave the audience to decide whether or not they believe COPD fits all those criteria. I suspect, as Susan has absolutely correctly said, I think it does generally, doesn't it? Um, but then one's got to look at how you choose the workplaces where the hazard has the most risk. And then you've got to look at the cost benefit benefit strategies and then make sure that your policies are aligned to that as well. That's quite a significant amount of work, I think, for the next next few years. My, my own two cents would be that I think periodic uh, lung function assessment can be quite useful for all the reasons pointed out, but it need not be annual. And in fact, if someone said, okay, you can have annual spirometry, or you can have every four years uh, spirometry and lung volumes that included DLCO, I'd choose the latter because we're not, um, what we're looking for is uh, accelerated uh, decline, which can be more easily detected the more the span of years is. And most workplaces will not be able or would not agree to do uh, annual uh, lung volumes. I, and I, I think our experience in Australia has shown the value in using uh, low radiation chest CT protocols and surveillance when we're thinking about the concomitant interstitial disease effects of silica, for example. So on Susan's case, where the diagnosis actually was silicosis with concomitant obstruction, theoretically, uh, screening CT might have revealed that earlier on. And also, one other comment, even though it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but just to expand people's horizons. I think in David's case, you could make the argument that if he was being currently exposed at the time, that pneumonia could also very well be an occupational disease. The other thing that I would mention about uh, uh, occupational surveillance is that while our uh, primary care, the primary care community, uh, at least in this country, uh, would have plenty of EKGs done on everybody, sometimes without need. Uh, occupational physicians can contribute a lot of information about lung health just based on the follow up of these cohorts. So one way or the other with uh, good organization and you know selection, whatever we could discuss about how and, and to do it, but that I think that it has a value, has demonstrated it, and it could contribute to uh, what we know about uh, lung health uh, uh, as we worry more about it uh, with all those trajectories that are being demonstrated in a study and uh, all, all, all the like. Okay, well, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan, go ahead. I just wondered if I could ask Raphael a question about his his follow-up with the, the rapid decliners. Um, I think you answered perhaps that you don't have a lot of occupational information subsequent to the World Trade Center collapse. Is that 
Is that correct? Or yes. Uh, it do you have information about differences for those rapid decliners? Uh, we know very few things. Uh, we knew that they were more heavily smoking and that they are gaining weight. Oh. Those two things we know. But there's more to know. In other words, I wouldn't stop there. And we there still have work to do in going back to all of that. Because what happened was that, as I said, at the beginning, everybody was tracking just the, the mean. <laughs> and the mean was very influenced by the majority. That was, you know, that green line in the middle. Uh, and it turns out that we, at, at some point, as soon as we could get, you know, funding on our hands and a good statistician on it, uh, we could actually see that there were those subgroups that uh, we need to worry more about and that we could learn quite a bit from. So yes, uh, we, we don't have the full answer. We have a couple of uh, indications and there's some more work to do uh, with that. Yeah. There's another question that, thank you for those, those comments. There's another question that has to do with uh, gold uh, standard zero. Um, uh, this was brought up. Uh, it says related to all presentations, including Dr. Fishwick's, sh should should this reinvigorate support um, for gold uh, uh, level zero? Or is it a, is it useful to identify early disease, or is it? I I really wonder if gold zero is not what we are calling chronic non-specific or non-obstructive bronchitis. Mm -hmm. Because goal zero was uh, defined by the presence of symptoms. And these days we are not requiring uh, at least three months for two years or, you know, depends on what you are defining. And, and yet what we are saying is that if somebody who is symptomatic on whom you have intention to treat because you think that they, those symptoms are uh, sufficiently deserving of treatment, but you don't have uh, the, what we presently uh, consider the diagnostic sine qua non of COPD, which is the post bronchodilator uh, FEV1 of FVC is less than 0.70 to be very precise. So with that, what, what I say is, oh, there is definitely a value of that. And some of the cases that we intervene on, for example, in the longitudinal uh, World Trade Center cohort were exactly that, where people who were symptomatic and were not meeting the COPD definition, that had we not treated them in those years, uh, their quality of life would have been diminished. And uh, whether we prevented disease, maybe not, you know, but certainly we, intervene and some of them uh, have uh, what we think was an, an, an improvement in the quality of life. I don't know what the other uh, speakers think about. Uh, right now, as you, some of you are aware, uh, uh, there is a, a new term trying to make its way uh, through the publication, which is pre-COPD. <laughs> And you may have seen it in the Blue Journal. And um, so it's pretty much the same concept in, in a way, a little bit diversified with considerations about uh, quantitative CT scan and this and the other. But, you know, it's more or less the same idea with a little bit of more shades of different colors. I don't know what other speakers think about that, but uh, I'm in favor. I, I think uh, Raphael's point is very well taken. And in fact, the publication that I showed that's in press with the elevated odds ratios for a lot of different occupations for symptomatic disease, that same study made a big deal of not being able to show uh, a decrement in lung function between those persons and everyone else. Uh, and I think uh, misinterpreted the implications because in fact, you could argue strongly since they showed a relationship with chronic bronchitis that in fact it is uh, stage zero. I think the other thing that we should be aware of is that in a person who has the variant of emphysema with very little obstruction, and we all know that that clinical presentation exists, of course, they wouldn't have COPD either. Uh, and we don't even know, and it's always been controversial whether chronic bronchitis is a risk factor for COPD or not. So we're kind of rehashing and a lot of our old arguments that arise out of the perceived need 
uh, among the early COPD epidemiologists to uh, not lose sight of tobacco smoking and therefore to play down anything that might detract from the predominant role of cigarette smoking. So it's a kind of, it's kind of medical politics in a way. Hmm. Any other comments from the panelists? No? Well, we're, we're out of time. So I'm gonna thank all of, all of, our, our, all of our speakers for their generosity. Um, and uh, you know, for um, you're taking the time to make the presentations and engage in the discussions. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.